With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Ah, oh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Let's talk the politics of information for a minute. We live in an amazing age. Uh, right in the palm of your hand, if you're listening to this on your uh, smartphone or on your desktop or whatever, but let's stick to smartphones for the purposes of this exercise. You have more computing power than NASA had when they put a man on the moon. With a couple of clicks, or you don't even have to click anymore. You don't even have to use your fingers. You can just ask it and talk to it if that's set up on your phone. You can get the entire breadth and width of human knowledge in just a few moments. That's an incredible power. That's an incredible thing. That's a lot of information, more information than millions of people in a million lifetimes could ever probably go through. What do we do with this power? Well, mostly we yell at each other, make fun of people and send cat pictures. And in politics, it's even worse because there's been something of an interesting phenomenon when it comes to political media. Now, everybody yells about the news media. Fair enough. They deserve some blame and credit. But social media is what's really changed everything in politics. First, we had the Internet. That really changed it because that moved off the network news monopoly of information and newspapers have changed and a lot of things have changed. But social media is what's really changed it because now between that the internet, an explosion of outlets, more commentators, more programs. You have podcasts now like ours where we're podcast and radio. You have TV shows. You can not have to try to get on TV. You can go on YouTube and make your own TV show. You have that ability right from your phone. Things have changed a lot, but it's just a tool. It matters what you do with it. A lot of people have used this power to not do information, they're just doing affirmation. You can a la carte your news feed, kind of like the old Shoney's breakfast buffet when the family would go up there and meet up and everybody could get exactly what they want and all sit down and eat together. Well, that's fine and good, but the problem is that also can pigeonhole you. Some people online, not uh, something I came up with, others have been using it for many years now, they call it siloing. You can get down in a silo like the old (laughs) nuclear deterrent silos. You just sit in your silo and wait for the right viral story to go by or the right message to come in or the right culture war thing or the right political thing to come in. Then you launch your missile onto social media. But the problem is you don't really know what's going on. You're just waiting for that one thing and reacting to it. That's a pretty good metaphor. I think it's something deeper that we actually got to talk about. Politics of information. What are you? Why are you following politics, and how does that affect the information you get? Do you take a wide breadth of information in, and make a good decision? We talk about it on our program. We want to discern the times we live in. That requires getting good information. Requires turning down the noise. It requires putting time on things that matter and putting aside the things that don't. A lot of people can tell me online a lot about Donald Trump and Joe Biden and Hunter Biden, and MAGA, and pick whatever you want. In your everyday life, how many people can do that? Or is it just your own life? If your online life isn't matching your real life life, do you have a good balance going? I'm not accusing anybody. Look, I'm way too online. Part of it's because I do things like herd tell and talking heading and writing and things like that. So I got to be more online than I really want to be. But do you have, we talk about work-life balance. Do you have a real life on life balance? If the people in your real life aren't talking about it as much as your online folks are, does it really matter that much? Do you have people offline that balance your online? That's a good one to kind of review. Let me ask you this. We've been talking a lot about education. I wrote a column about education this week coming up for the paper for the Faith Tribune. I'm kind of over people that can tell me everything about Donald Trump or Joe Biden or whatever the hot topic of the day is, but they don't know what the reading level for fourth and eighth graders are in their communities. They don't know what's going on with things like the economy. And I don't mean the big buzzwords where you just yell at whoever's the president because whoever's the president gets too much blame and too much credit for the economy. It's just a fact. Do you know about the actual economy like food stores closing, people looking for work, 
the service sector industry and how that has completely changed since COVID-19, how people's dollars aren't going so far because of inflation, but the metrics say that they were making more than they did previously, so it catches up, but people don't feel that, so that's why there's a disconnect to the news media presentation of economics. Do you actually talk about those things in a nuanced way that matters? The headlines and the nationalization of news has some good points. More people are aware, voter engagement's up, voter participation is up. I believe this next presidential election will once again break the record set in 2020. Now, a lot of that's negative. People are going to vote against somebody, but whatever. At least we're getting it up out of the 50s and into the 60s, and God willing, it'll go even higher and get a more engaged citizenry. But the politics of information matter. What are your politics? What are your information? And are those two meeting in a productive way? Are you trying hard to actually understand what's going on before you just spout off? Or are you only getting information that fits into what your politics already were and you're getting affirmation, not information? That's not a healthy thing. It's not a healthy thing for your social media. It's not a healthy thing for you yourself. It feels good. You can get an on group of what you think are friends and acquaintances because they'll all seal clap because you're saying the right things in your online groups or in your online meetings, or maybe even in real life. You may just have people, you may not have anybody in your life you don't disagree with on anything. But what does that do to your perspective? More than a point, what does that do to your community? You know, where you actually live, where your kids go to school, where your family's at. Maybe where you've lived for many years. Maybe where you're new to. Have you amalgamated into the new community you've moved into recently? These are things we need to talk about because you need information to do that. You don't want just people like you. Otherwise, you end up with a really small world full of people just like you. The best way to do that is use this technology in our smartphones and computers and social media and all that stuff to expand our worlds. To get a larger perspective, it's not going to change your values if your values are correct. It'll challenge some things that you think. And frankly, if it challenges them and you can't come up with a good answer, you probably need to go ponder on it a little bit and figure out what you really believe about it. Those are healthy human processes. Sitting in an online silo and just shooting your reactive missile when the right culture war thing comes across your Facebook page or your Twitter feed, that's not healthy. It's not really accomplishing anything. It's activity without anything to show for it, other than making a lot of noise. When we first put this program together, we decided very early on that was going to be one of our principles, turning down the noise. The best way to turn down the noise is to get more and more voices, wider voices, a global perspective while still keeping a caring hand on what's local and immediate to you. Information and the politics of information is really the currency of the age when you think about it. Because if you don't have good information, you're not understanding anything that's going on. Then what good are you to anybody? No matter who you vote for. More Hurtel right after this. Ah, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, she's back. Uh, Jill Jacobson, Young Voices, joining us on a topic. I was telling you, prepping this, I get really fired up on this one. I hate civil asset forfeiture. Let me break that down real quick, because I shouldn't say that. There is a legal reason for it. There is a precedent, is it? Inside of that, there's a kernel of a good thing that you need to have. The government can strip assets from a criminal enterprise. But when we think that, we're thinking, oh, drug cartels, we're going to take all the crap from them. Or, you know, Bernie Madoff stole a bunch of money. We're going to take it back, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what it's turned into, though. And a lot of people are just getting robbed blind by the justice system, whether they're actually convicted of a crime or not. This this statistic you bring up with the Newsweek, and we'll link to it, blows my Eighty percent of people don't even try to fight it. There's something very broken here, isn't there? Certainly. Thanks for having me. So just to take a step back, civil asset forfeiture is very different than traditional criminal forfeiture, which you might think of. For example, someone robs a bank, a prosecutor convicts them of bank robbery. And as part of that, they seize the the proceeds from that criminal act, right? Perhaps it's the money that they got when they robbed the bank or the getaway car. That's criminal forfeiture. 
Civil forfeiture is very different in that it does not even require a charge, let alone a conviction. It only requires that law enforcement merely suspects that the property was involved in a crime, even if it wasn't done by the owner. And that's the trick to it is the civil asset forfeiture is getting done on the front end of the legal process. In some cases, before they're even formally charged, arraigned, certainly before they're convicted. And then once they go through that process, then they have to try to get this stuff back, whether it's money or property. It's a very unevenly weighted process when the government and all the power of the government and the legal system can take it up front with basically no due process for all intents and purposes. And then you got to go through all the hoops as an individual citizen, try to get it back. Yeah, that brings up a really interesting point because civil forfeiture actions are between the property and the government, not between the property owner and the government, which leads to really strange case names like the United States versus Red Toyota Camry, which means that property owners are not entitled to the traditional due process and bill of rights protections afforded to the criminally accused. It also, to your point, flips the presumption of innocence on its head because property owners are deemed guilty until they come into court and prove their innocence, which is not how we traditionally conceive of the criminal justice system here in the United States. I love that you brought that point up because you bring up the case of this Crystal Starling lady up in Rochester, New York. It's kind of a bit of an extreme case, but it's not an uncommon case. We shouldn't need the extremes to realize how bad far afield something in the criminal justice has gone. But here's a great example of it. Give us her story because the legalese goes over people's heads. The numbers, the fact that this is $68 billion of American money that goes through the civil asset forfeiture process. That stuff kind of goes over our heads and we glaze our eyes a little bit. Tell us this lady's story because the stories of these are horrific. And I think that's where we can get some traction here. Yeah, so Crystal Starling is a woman up in Rochester, New York, who was saving up to turn her hot dog stand into a full-fledged food truck in New York City. When her boyfriend, who was then under investigation for drug trafficking, they, her apartment was um, searched by police. And they seized her entire life savings, all $8,000 that was meant to purchase this food truck through civil asset forfeiture. It's important to note that Crystal Starling was not involved in her boyfriend's activities whatsoever, and he was actually acquitted on these charges. But she reached out to the U.S. Attorney's Office after her money had been seized as part of this investigation, and they told her that she needed to wait until her boyfriend's case had concluded to initiate her process. And it's important to note that Starling actually proceeded pro se, which means without an attorney. Oftentimes people don't see the point in hiring an attorney when it's so expensive and oftentimes what's seized is not worth it. In other words, you pay more for an attorney than you do for the property that was taken by the government. So she hears this information that she must wait and so that's what she does. And then once her boyfriend has been acquitted on these charges, she reaches out and says, okay, you know, I am ready to initiate my proceeding to get my life savings back. And they say, well, we're not sure who told you that, but the deadline is passed. The court says that it's too late and the filing deadline is over. So she appeals this uh, with the help of the Institute for Justice. And the Second Circuit is on her side and they say, you know what, that's right. The purpose of filing deadlines really is to keep attorneys in line, to make sure that they're zealous advocates for their clients and that the justice system works as it should. They're not to penalize pro se litigants who are trying to navigate a really arduous and complex process on their own. So the Second Circuit sides with her and says, you know what, we are going to hold pro se litigants navigating civil asset forfeiture to what's called a good cause standard, which is that innocent procedural mistakes like this one um, should not work against them. Here's a question I have to lay this out for people and an example they'd understand. We've seen the stories that law enforcement, even prosecutors, even with warrants, can't get into an iPhone and get that information. But if there's a stack of cash sitting beside the iPhone on the nightstand table and the police are in there doing whatever, they can just pocket it and walk out the door and take it. That seems really unequitable to folks. Like that, that's just a wrong that is so glaringly obvious to everybody. But that's literally what is happening in some of these cases. They can't get into that iPhone, but they can just take a stack of money and walk out. And you may never see it again unless you go to court and go through all the hoops. 
Yeah, it, it's very strange. I mean, civil asset forfeiture has interesting roots. It's it's from maritime law, where people, law enforcement, couldn't necessarily find the pirates, but they could seize the ship, right? If there was criminal activity, that that is where it started, and it really was not used often at all until the war on drugs in in the late eighties. Now criminal forfeiture has exploded far beyond, I think, what anyone could have imagined at the beginning in, into something that really uh, does far more harm, in my opinion, than it does good. People contend that it is a law enforcement tool with serious benefits, but in its current manifestation, I, I don't think we're seeing that necessarily. Yeah. Jill Jacobson joining us. It seems to me that there's actually two avenues of reform here that I'm talking practical, not just railing against it, which I do plenty of because I really detest this. There's the front end part of it where we need to rein in the ability of law enforcement prosecutors and others to just take stuff for whatever reason without some clearly defined things. Maybe not a full blown warrant, but there needs to be some guidelines on that end. Then, as you talk about in your Newsweek article, the process of trying to get it back after also needs reform. You already talked about things like filing deadlines. There needs to be some kind of a clarification legally that property is still your property, even though it's tied up in the legal system. And you got to have some kind of an expectation of being able to get it back. It seems like both of those ends of the reform need to be done at the same time to really make some headway here. Definitely. There are Congress is currently looking at the FAIR Act, which is a bipartisan bill to sort of reintroduce some of these core due process protections back into federal civil asset forfeiture. Now, that does very little for the state systems, but at the federal level, that's a start. So listeners can be on the lookout for the progress of that. Um, but frankly, I don't think that we will truly see a just practice until civil asset forfeiture is abolished entirely. What's important to note is that criminal forfeiture exists, right? And it, and it's relatively uh, non-controversial. Once someone is convicted of a crime, the state can seize property used in that crime as part of the conviction itself, sort of at the sentencing phase. What's more controversial is, is this practice when people are never convicted of a crime, often not even charged, and their property is seized. So I think that would be a great place to start. All right, Jill Jacobson joining us. To put a bow on this a little bit, though, let's let's bring it back down to that practical level. People who get themselves caught up in the legal process, either by charges or a family member, or there's been cases where, you know, parents involved in the crime, they take stuff from the kids, you know, crazy stuff. We uh, we saw the unfortunate case of the newspaper uh, out in the Midwest where they, they raided the 90-some-year-old mother lived at home, and she ended up having a heart attack the next day just from the process. On a practical level, how do people inform themselves of their rights when it comes to things like dealing with the police? It may not even be a criminal thing. It may just be, you know, hey, somebody ran through my yard. The police come to the door. How do they talk to them? Just talk about people's practical rights in these lines when they can object to something, when they can talk about it, what they do have with their property rights. Their phone, let's say somebody's in a traffic accident. They just, hey, I got it on video what this guy did to hand their phone. That's a problem now. Give people a couple practical things to bring this down to their level of what they should actually know when it comes to their rights, when it comes to things like their personal property. Certainly. I think property and liberty go hand in hand, and we see that in the text of the Constitution. I mean, our founders recognized from the beginning of the United States that property and liberty are, are intertwined. I think what's most important is, is education. Much of the public does not know what civil forfeiture is until it impacts them or someone that they know. Um, knowing your rights is the first step. And I think oftentimes law enforcement take liberties that they shouldn't because they assume that people don't know their rights. Um, so getting educated and knowing your rights is, is the first step. Jill Jacobson, always thrilled to have her. Young Voices contributor. She's up at Boston College. She studies law and legal things, but still manages to explain it well enough that even I can understand it. That's why we keep having you back. Till we get you on again, let folks know where they can keep up with you and follow you, my friend. Thanks again. I'm Jill C. Jacobson on Twitter. We're going to link to this news week piece. It's got a lot of links in it. It's got some of the precedent, especially that second court precedent. You're going to want to read that one because that's the one that's going to kind of go forward here. Jill Jacobson, appreciate your time, my friend. Thanks again. Yes, ma'am.
Oh, welcome back to Hurt Tell. Going to be a homer here for a minute. Let's talk a little West Virginia stuff. If you follow me on social media, I have been harping, following, uh, boosting coverage, the mess that is going on at uh, WVU. Of course, more than just a flagship university to the state, and in many ways it's the public, because we don't have pro sports teams. Um, WVU really is the public facing to the outside world representation of the state in a lot of ways. And it's a hot mess right now. I've already written extensively about Gordon Gee and WVU. Education in general. In fact, I've got a piece coming out in uh, Fayette Tribune soon on education in the state. So I've, I've been on this for a while. And I went to school in West Virginia. My parents were public school teachers in West Virginia. Um, my daughter goes to college there now. Um, I, this, is, this is, of course, personal. But there's a, there's a teachable moment in all of this, like a lot of news stories. Our good friend Stephen Allen Adams, who is uh, the uh, reporter for Ogden Newspapers, does a lot of other stuff. I retweet him a lot because he's really good and knows what he's doing. He always writes his reporters' notebooks. He takes up an issue with this. It's entitled The Old College Trots out of the Parkersburg News and Sentinel. We're going to link to the entire piece. By the way, follow Stephen and the other West Virginia reporters I put on my social media. When things like the mansion stuff and the politics coming up – West Virginia is a difficult state to cover. If you're not actually in it, there's some uniqueness to it. Make sure you're following Stephen and folks like that. But I want you to read some of this to you. might just read the whole thing because it's all good, but there's this very glaring thing in education. Let me just put it the way Stephen put it here, reading from the News and Sentinel. I wouldn't call myself a public higher education reporter specifically. This is Stephen Adelon Adams writing. My beat is the state government, so I tend to cover higher education policy in the state from that mindset. Public colleges, universities, and community technical technical colleges are very strange bodies for me to cover. In a way, they are public-private hybrids. Direct state funding only makes a small portion of their budgets, which rely mostly on tuition from students. The taxpayers are more involved with the state's public higher education system than they may realize. Nearly all all are regulated by the state higher education policy commission only west virginia university marshall and fairmont state are exempt the governor appoints members to the board for college universities with the advice and consent of the state senate and even though state funding is but a small portion of the budgets of public colleges and universities your state and federal tax dollars play other roles faculty and staff of public colleges and universities are considered state employees The state signs their paychecks, and they receive health care through the Public Employment Insurance Agency, PEIA. Many students are funded through the federal Pell Grant and Stafford loans, and Congress distributes millions in various federal research grants and other funds to public colleges and universities. Point being, more of your tax dollars are involved in our state's public education system than you might think. I bring all this up because I've noticed a curiosity. I've been covering the now approved program and faculty cuts at West Virginia University on and off all summer. It's hard for me to cover every aspect of it, given my beat and the number of things I cover, but I've heard the concerns of professors, students, and even the WVU alumni. But I've yet to hear any concerns of parents or the public at large regarding the program cuts. I know parents are not always involved in their now adult offspring's post-high school education, but many are. And many help bear the burden of paying for that college, if financially able to do so, on top of students receiving grants, scholarships, and loans. I expect to see parents fired up one way or the other. But what about the public? Sure, I've seen plenty of fired up on social media, but those louts on social media don't reflect the overall public sentiment. Walking out amongst the real world outside of social media, those I know in the political world, I hear no outrage or concern about these cuts at all. Maybe it's due to West Virginians as a whole not having a high college-going rate. According to the U.S. Census, the percentage of West Virginians between 2017 and 2022 with a bachelor's degree of higher was 21.8%. It makes sense, then, that you're not seeing outrage at WVU on the streets. But even despite the loudest voices I've heard from students and faculty at WVU opposing the cuts, I've been surprised how small that number is compared to the total number of students and faculty at West Virginia University. Sure, the University Assembly, consisting of the full-time faculty, voted 797 to 100 last week in favor of a resolution of no confidence in President E. Gordon Gee. This seems like a large number, except that there are more than 2,400 full-time faculty. 
those votes for no confidence in Guy represent maybe only 32% of the full-time faculty. And while there are plenty of students protesting and speaking out, keep in mind that there are more than 18,000 students on the Morgantown campus alone. Don't mention all this to diminish those who express their outrage. If anything, I mention it because I'm touched, surprised there isn't more outrage. I'm also not saying you should be outraged or care. That's on you. But consider if so much taxpayer dollars are involved with WVU and other public higher institutions of learning. I guess I at least expected more interest. I've written in this space before my concerns about lacking of interest from the public over our K-12 through student proficiency numbers in English, reading, math, and writing. New numbers came out last week showing that while numbers are improving, they are still below pre-pandemic levels. And pre-pandemic levels were not good either. Instead, I've seen more outrage about a new law allowing students the ability to transfer schools one time without having to set out a high school sports for a year. Allegedly, this has caused some high school athletic programs to shrink and others to grow and start running up scoreboards. Seems to me this law has exacerbated a problem that was already happening as plenty of high schools ran up their scoreboards for football last year prior to the law's existence. I can easily imagine the same people who appear to not be paying attention to WVU's program cuts probably have many opinions on WVU's basketball and football programs. I just wish we, the public, cared as much about our educational institutions as we do high school and college sports. That's from Stephen Allen Adams. Uh, it's in the News and Sentinel. We will link to it, read the whole piece. Make sure you follow Stephen. But excellent points. Imagine if we cared about math and reading scores as much as we do sports. And I like sports. I was all in on WVU's football game playing Pitt, the big rivalry, if you're not familiar, the backyard brawl. Watched every minute of it. But the rest of the time, the other 364 days of the year, we should probably care about what the students are doing, how our money's going towards that, and what kind of university and education system we're going to have. More hurt tell right after this. Uh, Welcome back to Heard Tell. Okay, you probably heard tell by now that the Barbie movie is a pink juggernaut. It has surpassed one of them Harry Potter films. I don't know which one, although I've seen them all because I have kids too. It's very, very successful, and the cultural debates died down a little bit. So this is about the good time when we like to go back and actually rehash this now that the noise is turned down and we can get into the actual issues behind it. Or was there an issue behind it? Uh, Aaron Pomerantz, Young Voices contributor, he does this psychology stuff with culture that's going to be really helpful here. He's even one of them doctors. Sir, appreciate your time. Welcome to the program. No worries. Thank you for having me on. All right. I've got some biases here i got to lay out on the front end. Uh, I've been a girl dad for a long time, so I'm pretty immune to pink and girly and whatever else you want to throw at me at this point. I've been through, you know, all the winks and Barbies and Care Bears and you name it, I've done it. So I'm probably not the best person on stuff like this because it doesn't bother me one little bit. My kid even went to the thrift store, got me a Barbie t-shirt for when we went and watched the Barbie movie. I don't care. It doesn't bother me at all. I think a good place to start here, and you were writing about this in the counter punch. There's when we talk about culturally and politically conservatives, I think we need to draw a distinction between people who are professionally conservative online and in the media and people that are conservative as part of a creed or an ideology or lifestyle, or however you want to put it. I think this was a real clear divide on this issue. You dealt in it. Is that a good way to kind of bifurcate this before you get into what's actually going on? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I like that term professional conservative because I and versus principled conservative because I I don't think there's a principled conservative case against the Barbie movie at all. In fact, I think like you could make a principled conservative case for the Barbie movie, but they're, you know, the people who reacted the strongest to this on the right wing tended to be I mean, they're online commentators, so I don't know if we still call them talking heads. But that sort of person who just they, they sell their opinions, they sell their outrage. And they were trying to they were trying to say that they were in the principled conservative camp, 
but I think it was all about just 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 selling that viewpoint using the label conservative without any underly- underlying principle behind the outrage. I think sometimes in commentary, and I look, I'm guilty of it too because I do too. I write op eds. I've been very way too online for a couple of years now because this is what I do. I think the term principle, we got to kind of treat it a lot like things like leadership or things like other things. If you've got to open up by telling somebody you're being principled, you probably aren't. That should be a self-evident thing. You just are principled. You just are a good person. You just are a leader. One of the best things I ever got told is a piece of advice. Like, look, if you got to tell people you're in charge, you're not in charge because you shouldn't have to say that. I think principled has become that. And when we get to an issue like a Barbie movie or like whatever the next cultural hot. See, look, we've talked about this on the program before. These the Barbie movie is not a new argument. We just changed the nomenclature to fit the Barbie movie and had the same argument we always have, right? That's what yeah. we're talking about with these principled folks. If you got to say you're principled, you're probably not. This this is a bit of a nomenclature problem, is it not? I mean, I th- I, yeah, I think, and I think there's, I mean, it's, it's it's a part of nomenclature problems. I think there's a lot of ways you could slice it. Uh, I think I reference in the piece I think there's a lot of stuff that's in principle in the Barbie movie. There, there is room for principles to be held by both sides. There's room for people who are who are from a principled conservative bent, like small p, actual principled conservatives, to find material there. But then there comes a question of what does it mean to be a a conservative, and that's another part of this problem. Is does it mean when you say you you have conservative principles, are we talking Russell Kirk and Edmund Burke? Are we talking, you know, the more uh, compassionate conservatism movement, like the Freedom Conservative Statement, or, or Marvin Alasky, someone like that, or are we talking not liking change, or are we talking simply, you know, well, I don't, I'm a social conservative, not an economic conservative, which seems to be the the direction that a lot of professional conservatism is going. So there, it, it's it's there's a lot of nomenclature problems at play here, and something I find very aggravating as a social scientist because for us it's all got to be about you know what is your you know what, what, what do you mean when you say a term that be really clearly defined and i think that when it comes to the which we could you call professional conservatives certainly a lot of the people who are outraged by the barbie movie outraged in, in air quotes I, I i don't think they actually have many principles of their conservatism that they're that that their outrage is, is based in. I think it's just, you know, the term conservative means what it means to them at the moment. These are their principles. And if you don't like them, well, they have others as well. Yeah, Aaron Palmer, it's joining us. It's interesting because there's actually a part of this movie, and you talked about it in your piece in The Counterpunch too, that actually the, a lot of this movie is about identity. And, it, and look, mm-hmm. th- look, this isn't glory. This isn't, you know, how green was my valley. We're, we're, we're saying there's meaning to this, but we're deriving it pretty. We're getting the divining stick out to get the meaning out. This isn't a super deep movie. But you talked about Ken on the beach, and I think it fits perfectly with what we're talking about with the very online folks that do this for a living in a business stream. And I'm fine with being a capitalist. I hope they all eat very well. I don't have any problem with anybody making money. <laughs> But there's the scene, and you bring it up on a beach. Ken's identity is beach. It's not swimming because he can't swim. It's not surfing because he can't surf. And there's the hilarious little subplot about the fact that they're like, oh, so you're a lifeguard. He's like, no, I'm not a lifeguard. I just do beach. Well, beach isn't a thing, but it's his entire identity, even though to nobody, nobody else has any clue what he's talking about. As a social scientist, though, that little nugget there of like he is completely has his identity wrapped around all these individual words that mean a lot, but when he put it together into his worldview, nobody else has any idea what he's actually talking about. I I think we could beat that metaphor to death a little bit on some of this, don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I think that's honestly, you know, on the one hand, yeah, it's just the Barbie movie when you said, like, we're kind of beating it with a stick to get the meaning. But I think on the other hand, there are a lot of great movies that are co- they weren't meant to be that serious, quote unquote. But I think in the form of a comedy, you, you can raise these issues. Um and I think the Barbie movie does just that. You know, yeah, Ken's identity is is beach, but really, uh, and there's there's a line by the the narrator played by Helen Mirren. It's a uh, it's something along the lines of you know, Barbie has a good day every day. Ken only has a good day when Barbie looks at him. And like so many people, whether they have their identity wrapped up in one or two things, uh, the movie is very clearly taking aim at people who have their identity wrapped up in their relationships but you could just as easily talk about the fact that ken his identity is beach and he doesn't seem that good at it because what does it mean to be beach 
uh, he, he, what, what, are, what are the objectives and key results of, of the job position of Beach? Um, th- th- he has no meaning. And that lack of meaning really eats at him, I think. And that, what's that what leaves him vulnerable to radicalization because he hasn't formed an identity that's self-contained. He hasn't formed an identity that is strong and fulfilling to him. So when he discovers patriarchy, quote unquote, uh, even though he seems to think in the movie it's mostly about horses, <laughs> he discovers patriarchy, he becomes radicalized by it. And I actually think that's a really powerful, in a funny way, but still a very powerful way because it's not preachy, I don't think. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good commentary on how with not having a solid identity is actually very dangerous. And this is something that people all over the ideological spectrum have talked about. Um, including people who are like very close to some of the the figures who got so outraged about the the issue. As a psychologist, I don't agree with him on a lot because he comes from a very different perspective than I do and has gone a direction I'm not really fond of. But something Jordan Peterson did bring attention to certainly a few years ago was that very lack of identity and the dangers of a lack of identity. And a lack of identity, he literally made the point, leaves you open for radicalization. And that's basic psychological truth and here's the barbie movie pointing that out and it's doing it in a funny accessible way that we can take our kids to and yet people are getting all up in arms about it calling it preachy and shrill and saying it's the, it hates men and i'm like well in an era where andrew tate is supposed to be treated as if he's a serious voice as opposed to a alleged, and that's in very big air quotes, sex trafficker and a self-admitted abuser of women, I think it's worth having the conversation about where men put their identity and, and, and how we can have a healthy sense of identity in men since people like this dude, Andrew Tate, are gaining so much attention from young men who's, even if they wouldn't say that their identity is Beach or Barbie, uh, that seems to be the level of identity they've established. Folks, you've heard of Ethan Brown on the Hurt Tell Show a couple of different times, but if you're interested in learning about how to discuss things like climate change without all the politics and doom and gloom, head over to his podcast, The Sweaty Penguin. Sweaty Penguin is a late-night comedy-style climate podcast working to add nuance, critical thinking, humor, and hope to the climate conversation. they got over 100 episodes already, breaking down weekly news stories and specific topics from the vanilla to the ADHD to the international accountability to orangutan. Yes, I know, it's a comedy thing, so just go with it. But each time, exploring different ways we can make progress on these issues while still helping the economy, health, security, and everything else we care about. Feel overwhelmed, exhausted, or excluded by today's climate change discourse? This is the podcast for you. Find The Sweaty Penguin wherever you get your podcast or at www.thesweatypenguin.com. Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. Yeah, Aaron Pomerantz joining us. This gets us to culture and politics because, you know, again, these terms have been beaten to death, but you're a social scientist. Give us some good waypoints on this. Things like projection, things like identity, things like identity politics. We know what identity is. We know what politics is. You put the words together. Now you got this toxic thing you got to explain. The problem is, though, all of this underlies so much of what's going on in culture and politics. The reason you know, certain people can try to burn a Barbie doll in a trash can and get a lot of hits on us because it hits with a certain segment. This is part of our culture and politics. And even though we don't like it, we have to deal with it. 
how do we deal with it in a healthier way than just that clickbait noise buzzword way that just seems to perpetuate itself how do we talk about this a little bit more healthy i think by not clicking to be honest with you um people who who burn barbie mobiles ben shapiro most especially but a lot of the other people who've been involved in this they're outrage mongers this is what they sell for crying out loud some of the people yelling about this movie hadn't even seen it and even ben shapiro who did see the movie he talked about how he had to be dragged and it was exactly what he thought it was going to be well that's confirmation bias that's that's a classroom example of confirmation bias he went in expecting to have a bad time and lo and behold he had a bad time who among us has not gone to a birthday party where we had a similar experience or some some similar social engagement but of course, you know, if 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 we take a step back, we think about it that Ben Shapiro exists to sell the Daily Wire. These other people exist to sell the Daily Wire. Here's Morgan, who also got mad about this. I forget what program he has. I'm sure he has a news program. He's selling himself. And outrage is a very addicting emotion, especially when you combine it with moral righteousness. And you get to say things like, oh, the Barbie movie is a fundamental attack on men. It's undermining our society. Uh, the one I found as a fellow girl dad, although my baby is very young, she's my, my, do- my girl's a toddler, uh, but my least favorite criticism of this was from another Daily Wire, Wire contributor, Matt Walsh, who was like, yeah, take your daughters to see this if you want them to be nasty shrews. And I'm like, what movie did you see, man? Also, like, like, like that, that sort of language, that feels good, right? That's the sort of like language and venom that when we spit it at someone, when we spit it at something because we're frustrated, it feels good in the moment. But then it fades away really fast, and we need to find something else to hit that that button to feel good, that dopamine surge. So the simplest solution is to not start, is to not fall for the outrage. And I'd love to say it's hard to detect when there's outrage, but it's really not. These are not subtle news arguments. You don't click on one of these, you know, some so-and-so owns people with facts and logic, or so-and-so destroys the Barbie movie in caps. You know what you're getting when you click on that. Don't click on it. You know when you go when you go to see a cultural viewpoint or a cultural uh, happening, like Barbie. And Barbie was a cultural happening, right? Like you could, like the world was bright pink for a week or more. Go go with an open mind. Don't read a bunch of reviews telling you what you're supposed to think about it. You know, I went in expecting to have fun because it was the first movie I'd gone to see with my wife since the last James Bond film. Which there's a juxtaposition. And I was like, I was going to go in, I was going to have fun, wore my pink polo, she wore her pink shirt, like just wanted to have fun with my wife. And lo and behold, I actually didn't go in expecting to find something thought provoking. And I walked out of it with like, well, wow, there's a lot to actually talk about in this movie because I went in not really expecting to be mad. So I think not falling for outrage and not from that taking expectations about what you're going to see what other people believe how certain uh interactions with other people or how other viewpoints than yours think feel and behave avoiding all of that sidestepping it and just seeing for yourself uh, it's another overused phrase but it's the one i'm very fond of touching some grass <laughs> go outside get off the internet touch grass which is very rich of me to say as i'm on an internet for show and you know i do most of it i wrote op and op-ed on the internet right but you know go outside touch grass find, find somebody and talk about the barbie movie as opposed to being told what to think about it by somebody who does the very very normal thing of setting a plastic toy on fire you know my favorite thing about that aaron palmer is showing us they weren't man enough to actually know how to start a fire so they actually had like the lighting of the lighter and then it was a <laughs> cgi little burst of flame and then they do a quick cut at it to when they actually could get the fire going, but that's neither here nor there. You mentioned it a few minutes ago. You mentioned it in the piece. You even put it in quotes. That means it's important when academics do things like that. It means you got to pay attention to that. The word discourse, um, it's an important term to us because we talk about on this, you know, this is the no hollering program. We don't yell, we talk. The debate me bro of a lot of those same people where they're saying they want discourse, they don't want debate. They don't really. They just want, you know, a talking point to counterpunch on and yell further about as a social scientist, though, there there is a pretty well honed through thousands of years of recorded human history how you have discourse with people. Like we know how to do it, right? Just yeah. you know, clinically, or you know, if you just had an open mind class sitting down, like here's your couple points. 
how do we actually have a discourse? Because there's some real distinct points to having a healthy discourse. There's give and take. There's listening. There's reacting without overreacting. That's reacting to what they're saying and having a salient point. Just as a social scientist, though, maybe a lot of people, they just don't know how to have a discourse anymore because we're not real good at it in our society right now. Give folks a couple pointers on it, like what's a healthy discourse or at least how to identify it. And maybe we can start practicing it a little better. Yeah. Um, in terms of action items, I mean, there's a lot of ways this could go. I think the the two most important things, especially when it comes to, to culture war adjacent stuff, which even though I do not think the Barbie movie was intending to do this, it got dragged into the culture wars. The two things you can cultivate to have a good discourse with other people, even those you disagree with, are number one, intellectual humility, by which I mean acknowledging that you can be wrong. Not going around thinking, this is not the same as having an open mind to the point that your brain falls out, right? This is not, you know, oh, I'm always wrong, or you're probably right. This is not being intellectually timid, but going, maybe I'm wrong, and if I am wrong, I am willing to be convinced. Listening to people's arguments. It's why, like, uh, I'll confess, I don't watch a lot of things from these people when they have debates because they interrupt each other and they interrupt the person they're they're debating. And I did debate in high school, and, you know, and now I'm an academic. It's like you, you talk over people. Like, that to me is that's, – that's it. That's done. So having some intellectual humility, letting people get their arguments out, being willing to, to approach things with an open mind. That would be number one. And number two would be cultivating some emotional intelligence. Uh, emotional intelligence is sorely lacking, I think, in today's society, especially when it comes to issues like the culture war or politics. But emotional intelligence is also one of the most valuable things you can have. I think there's a reason that it's something that employers look for so strongly in the in the quote unquote real world. And when I talk about emotional intelligence, I'm specifically thinking of the elements of it to take a step back, take what's called a meta moment and think, what am I feeling right now? Why am I feeling it? And how is it about to guide my decisions? So, you know, oh, you you see the Barbie movie and for whatever reason, you feel very threatened by it. Take, take that step back and go, why am I feeling threatened? Why do I feel that this movie hates women as a, or hates men rather? Uh, and and be our, to take a moment and reflect on that and realize, you know, oh, maybe maybe it's not actually anything in this movie. Maybe it's something that I've experienced or maybe it's something about my preconceptions. Similarly, why would people like this movie? And, and then even more important than that, and totally step it from the Barbie movie, once you think about how you're emotionally responding to something, think about how other people are going to emotionally respond to it. Now, if you want to outrage people, that's you can manip you can there's such thing as bad use of emotional intelligence but if you want to have a discourse it's the oldest thing in the book my dad used to tell me it when i was a kid right like think before you speak like oh well you know you know but, but ben shapiro we brought him up he just dug in his heels after setting the barbie mobile on fire and he kept like digging his digging the grave of his own dignity deeper and deeper as he kept basically screaming, no, what I did was very, very normal. And you all are just mad about it because you hate traditional gender roles and you hate men. Well, no, the reason people are harping on you setting a Barbie mobile on fire is because it's unhinged and it comes off as unhinged. As a psychologist, I can tell you that is not behavior that brings people in. That is not behavior that has a discourse or that starts a discourse. So if you want to have a discourse, think about how am I expressing myself? Is this really going if, to if, – if, if I want to hear somebody's opinion, if and I start a discussion by saying, what do you think of that you know, shrewish, man-hating movie Barbie? Do you think somebody's going to want to have a conversation with you about that? No. So having some intellectual humility and emotional intelligence, um, that's the only way we're going to ever go back to having, I think, actual discourse in, in politics and culture. it goes back to one of those things we said earlier too we talked about leadership and principles being self-evident mm -hmm. you know one of mine too is like if you gotta tell people you're being manly 
<laughs> that's not something you have to i'm being a man now uh no cringe alert um you ended your piece with this and i think it's important you you quoted the movie here with the do the imagining don't be the idea there really is a thing both in social science but especially in politics where people get trapped in an idea and they can't figure out how to get out of it you know it's the old mm -hmm. austin powers how'd you get in this nutshell well i don't know but i can't get out of this nutshell Ideas are fine things, but ideas without context and without the human element of them, they really do become kind of prisons here. I know I harp on the buzzwords, but I think it's important if if you're just going to do a buzzword without the meaning behind it or you're just going to follow what somebody else is, you really are making these little intellectual prisons for yourself. And then you get caught up in the flow of, oh, well, everybody that uses this buzzword must be OK. Therefore, I must follow them. Is that as big? I know this is a very online thing because I'm too very online, but the world's getting more and more online, and I think we're exposing yeah. more and more of that. Is there really an answer to it, or is this just one of those societal change moments where we kind of got to put our head down and get through it, and there's just going to be some casualties because folks don't know how to deal with it? I think I think there's a... I think there's a specific way this manifests online and the chronically online, which you're describing. It's, you know, uh, in terms of social psychology terms, we call that group think and risky shift and group polarization and then group dynamics, right? So you, you don't want to disagree with your group. You stay true to the group label. And then you start, as you all get more and more insular, you become more and more extreme and anyone who disagrees with you is clearly bad. That's happened since time out of mind. Like that is just, that's just part of being human. And so, like, the idea that if we all got offline, as, as, as lovely as that would be, if we all got offline, we'd somehow avoid those. Well, no, I, I think that those phenomena would still be around. But that being said, I think that there's a degree to which we actively enable it. There's a degree to which we can keep enabling it versus making an intentional decision not to. You know, when I said, when I love that quote, you know, do the, imagine, do the imagining, don't be the idea. Well. So the the both one of the manliest men I know and one of the most conservative men I would know, and they're not the same man, so I'm not going to name them. But <laughs> both love the Barbie movie. The most manly man I know, like this is a dude, like in terms of stereotypical masculinity, significantly taller than I am, muscles the size of my head. He also gets mani pedis with his daughters all the time. He wore his pink to the movie because he's secure in his masculinity. He knows he's a man, so you know. He doesn't feel the need to insist on it, and he doesn't need to think. Well, what is the opinion of men? What does a what does a man think about the Barbie movie? He goes, "What do I think about the Barbie movie?" Similarly, the most conservative man I know. I mean, this 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 guy, like, if he hadn't, if Russell Kirk hadn't still been alive when he was when he was born, I would think he was the second coming of Russell Kirk. And yet, he also liked the Barbie movie because he went into it thinking, "I want to go see the Barbie movie with my family," not. What does the conservative think about Barbie? What must I as a conservative? You know, we get wrapped up in these identities, these ideas that we take as our labels. And then we're like, we have to basically hold the party line or hold the, 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 the portrait policy, whatever you want to call it. We surrender our individuality to the group. And that can be really helpful. That's a helpful thing evolutionarily when we're talking about something meaningless like fashion. There's that, that, Surrendering our individuality excuse me, to the group is why nobody wears powdered wigs anymore. But when it comes to something like you know, cultural literacy or, or forming social connections or let alone how we move forward as a society, not that the Barbie movie is just quite the same as that, uh, surrendering your identity and your individualism to the collective is not a healthy thing. So I think that the, the the trends may be the phenomena may be universal and there's no escaping them, but the specific way it's manifesting right now with with the polarization, I, I think we have to to go back to what I said earlier. Stop reinforcing the outrage and then just put our heads down. And stop stop feeding the trolls under the bridge and eventually they will go away. Hopefully, that would be my hope. Yeah, Dr. Aaron Palmer has been joining us. We've been talking about the Barbie movie, wider culture, and why that explains everything about politics, because that's how social science works. You get one thing, it explains everything, right? Um, 
let folks know where they can keep up with you. I love talking about this stuff. Look, we call our program Culture and Politics because this stuff all overlaps. There's a lot of cross streams here. Mm -hmm. I like the work you do. You're a social psychologist down in the Houston area. Let folks know where they can keep up with you and follow you and what you have going on until we get you back on the program again, my friend. We're also going to link to the Counterparts article and your other work, but let them know how they can keep up with you. Yeah, so as, as I said, I'm, I'm not the most uh, online of people, but I, I do have a Twitter, a pompom92, rather sorry, pompom9211, uh, and you can fo follow me there. I'll p I post any op-eds I write and get published. I post my research there, and I also post some of the, the more applied work I do and, and the work of other people that I think kind of helps and that is applicable no matter what side of the aisle you fall on, no matter what side of the culture war you might sort of align with. I, I try to keep an open mind and, and find stuff and post it there that I think anyone could be uh, uh, could find appealing. So you can follow me there. All right. Do you, How much of the movie have you quoted to yourself and or your family since you've seen it? Oh, um, well, around the office, <laughs> there's been a lot of, I am Kenuff. Uh, I do a lot of my work specifically in the psychology of masculinity and culture. So there's been a lot of I am Kenuff quotes um, or our my job is beach or some variety of that. That happens a lot. Um, not quite always as much now, uh, now that it's been about a month since I've seen it. And, and, and But they're all still uh, – I, I will say, I think this is going to become one of my one of my go to movies. It is just so quotable, and my wife and I like to kind of communicate in pop culture quotes anyway. So, d d yeah, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Unless, <laughs> unless I just try to think of like, what was the last time I quoted the Barbie movie? But it was recently, and I will probably do it again before the week is out, just because I like it. The uh, Mojo Dojo Casa House of the Mind would yes. be an excellent uh, piece of, uh, I'll just give you that for free. You don't even have to give me a line for it, but that'll be a good book when you get around to it. Aaron Pomerantz, appreciate your time, sir. Thank you very much. No worries. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yep. That'll do it for this edition of Heard Tell. Wherever you are, you can join us through whatever medium you're listening to. If you're on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, we're even on some podcasts over in India. You folks in India, we see you on the stats. Welcome. Thank you. Drop us a line. We're all over the world and on any podcasting platform you can think of. Make sure you're subscribing and or following or whatever that platform calls it. That helps us keep track of you, lets us know how you're listening to the program, make sure we can tailor it to get it to you. Heard Tell Show or my name, Andrew Donaldson, on any of those platforms, it'll come right up. But we have a one-stop shop for everything that we do, herdtell.substack.com. It's completely free. Subscribe. You get everything right into your inbox. Anytime I write, do a media appearance, do a new episode of Heard Tell. We also have Heard Tell specials. We're going to get back to doing the Twice on Sunday recap shows. We also have a huge archive, so we're going to have some specials, some best of, things like that, and also some of the food writing from Yonder and Home. We're starting to re-up that as well. we got over 600 episodes of Heard Tell in the archive to start porting over. We're going to be working on that. So sign up for the Substack, please. Get you right in your inbox. Never miss anything. Doesn't cost you anything more than a click. Herdtel.substack.com. We sure appreciate it. And follow us on social media. Herdtel Show on the Twitter. Four for the Fire is my personal Twitter handle. No, we're not going to call it X. But if you could share us and let folks know that our programs are worth checking out, we sure would appreciate it. So wherever you are, across the street or around the world, we hope you're well. We hope you are well fed. We'll talk to you real soon for the next Hurt Tell. All the music on Hurt Tell is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com. So Folks, if you've listened to the Hurt Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. 
From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. Folks, you've heard of Ethan Brown on the Hurt Tell Show a couple of different times, but if you're interested in learning about how to discuss things like climate change without all the politics and doom and gloom, head over to his podcast, The Sweaty Penguin. Sweaty Penguin is a late-night comedy-style climate podcast working to add nuance, critical thinking, humor, and hope to the climate conversation. they got over 100 episodes already, breaking down weekly news stories and specific topics from the vanilla to the ADHD to the international accountability to orangutan. Yes, I know, it's a comedy thing, so just go with it. But each time, exploring different ways we can make progress on these issues while still helping the economy, health, security, and everything else we care about. Feel overwhelmed, exhausted, or excluded by today's climate change discourse? This is the podcast for you. Find The Sweaty Penguin wherever you get your podcasts or at www.thesweatypenguin.com.